When talking about the trajectory of their gender queerness, Rack stated that the two terms have become less hinged and more commingled. And although they told me not to hold them to this, I loved their answer, maybe I'm queering my own transing. <laughs> I can certainly dig that. So please help me welcome Rax to the stage. The Fox and the Grapes. I'm eating tangerines. The peels will sit in piles, veiny, orange, withering. Another tangerine I'm dithering. I eat low-hanging fruit. I won't admit the sky into my view, lest it transmit temptation. Ashamed of grapes, I'm slithering through vines and brush. Their sour come hithering sends me careening homeward toward my pit. So many tiny fruits, so plump, so mauve. I long for them with each sharp tooth. I see them in my sleep. They dangle tempting me. I beat wide tracks around their grove, but still I smell their lack. From where they hung, one fell. I tasted it. It seared my tongue. I was cruising through Tumblr, uh, and, and I saw this picture, and I was just like, Phew. It's, uh, it, it's by a user named Ari Hondro, and if you're interested in like survivor work or trans identity, their stuff is on point. Uh, but I'm going to try to because I don't have it for you. Uh, it's a picture of a woman in a red riding hood outfit. Uh, she has a wolf's arm and leg on one side, and she's just like staring right at the canvas at you uh, with, with a bandage over one eye. Uh, and there's a, a silhouette of a house, and in the text of the house behind her it says, I make no apologies for how I chose to repair what you broke. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought about that, and I thought about myself and the way that I use animality in my own identity. Uh, and it captured something I really hadn't managed to place before. Uh, and I, I don't want to say that I wouldn't have become a fox in some way if I hadn't been abused, or that I wouldn't meow to say hello to people if I hadn't experienced trauma. There are other paths that probably would have awakened those kernels, encouraged those habits, if I hadn't been forced on the ones that I was. But it doesn't matter for me, because my foxification is tied up in my need to defend and delineate myself in response to trauma in ways that I'm still working to tease apart. Uh, sometimes, and I hope you all don't have this experience, but I suspect some of you do feel like a terrible unperson, some kind of abomination unto man and God, a thing unworthy of kindness or compassion. And there are a lot of reasons for this, but the one that always makes it stick for me is that if I were a person, deserving and beautiful, why would people have hurt me without remorse? Why would others take pleasure from my unwilling suffering? I must be trash, or else the world is so terrible that how could it even exist? I, I mean, this is busted. But it's the kind of busted thinking that's incredibly difficult to get past, and for me, the way I get past it is to take on that position of the animal and lay claim to it, and demand my own worth regardless of my inhumanity. Um, I, I'm sort of following here Susan Stryker, who in my words to Victor Frankenstein, reclaims the monstrous by saying that, I assert my worth as a monster in spite of the conditions my monstrosity requires me to face, and redefine a life worth living. My life, my survivor's furry gender-fucked life with the Pokemon and the fixed gear bicycle and the androgynous face and the pain and the pink glasses and <laughs> pasta with oil sauce for dinner pretty much every night, <laughs> is a life worth living. The archetypes that called to me, the limb I stitch on to replace those taken from me as the woman in the image did, I took not from humans but from foxes. So when I look at my, as myself as a furry, I'm using an intermediary to see the self I cannot see in the mirror or in photographs. The human eye and the camera are not suitable intermediaries to view me. I'm also a cat from time to time. I grew up with cats. They, they were my friends more than the people around me sometimes. And I take on those physical trappings, the, the ears, the tail. Uh, <laughs> you know, more often, uh, first of all, because it's fun. But it's also a more effective form of externally visible armor. Uh, presenting as feline, which, because I'm a huge dork, I like to call going out and shot, uh, taps into a bunch of archetypes about female sexual availability, even when you're presenting male, or when I'm trying to, I think. But the one time I tried it in a men's dress suit, something different happened. And that sort of thing is fun and sometimes terrifying, but it's not the main reason I'm doing it. It taps into these archetypes for me of feline ineffability and a different means of boundary enforcement. 
when I'm wearing street clothes and someone harasses me or pressures me into interacting with them and it's not this hoodie that I can just point to. Uh, <laughs> I have difficulty saying no to them. I freeze up. It takes a lot out of me to manage that because I'm full of fears that it won't be respected even if I do. Uh, when I'm a cat, I just hiss at them. Maybe claw them. Move on. It's legitimately much easier to enforce those boundaries for me, and it costs me less. The costume isn't the thing that makes it possible, but sometimes it's the thing that makes it accessible. Literally sewing together that felinity to evoke that I've sewn metaphorically into myself. Uh, I, I will ask this, and no one else has to, since we're talking about cat costumes. Isn't furry like a sex thing? I, I actually get this question from, from everyone. I got it from academics when I tried to go to grad school for this. I get it from cosplayers who, who would sort of think would get it. Uh, and there's tons of fascinating, snarky, beautiful answers to this question, but I want to add this. The human racks who might have had sex is gone, if they ever existed. I had to sew something else in there to build a racks capable of such vulnerability. But don't worry for me. My paws are softer than hands, my claws more nimble than fingers, and my teeth every bit as eager as a man's. I can love as a cat does, aloof and unconditional, or as a fox, distant and hungry, or as a cactus, slow and resolute. I love as a human does, only in that these are ways a human can love and is loving. It's not that furry is a sex thing, my sex is a furry thing, and I wouldn't and couldn't have it any other way. I just want to note that this relationship to the animal, while it's amazing for me, is not unproblematic. Uh, I want to mark space here that this use of animal archetypes is connected to, but not directly about, the experiences of, of actual animal-born animal animals. <laughs> there, there, there's not a word. Those are all terrible, but I, if you got a better one, hit me up after this, please. Uh, who are affected and, and affect this kind of identity work. And there are also people who experience being called animal as deeply negative and hurtful for both personal and structural reasons. I'm able to claim and own and inhabit that and get something beautiful out of it, but that isn't the right path for everyone, and my decision and comfort is affected by which structural reasons assholes had for calling me inhuman while abusing me. Someone else might respond to that with a fierce declaration of humanity and rock on. But as for me, I am menagerie, and when the narrative of the human cannot staunch my wounds, I find another. Now my hands are shaking and I can't actually take this page off. There we go. Alright, more poems. So this is where you feel safest. Wrapped in blankets, stale with sleep sweat. You own no matches, but hold candles never kindled. Windowsill, desk, on the floor in a jelly jar. Praise to the absence of fire. Your tools of exaltation, books and bindings, rest on the nightstand. Dust swaddles them. Lately, you worship by not worshiping. This intrigues me. Against myself, I lay down against you. To shun flame, to sun curtains, the consistency of familial ritual. Hide, child. You curl up, camouflaged, closed, trembling when the predator comes. I open the door. Clean air rekindles lavender, and I see in you fear's avatar. I mime a snuffed candle, then depart. You lock the door behind me, still asleep. Mm. Hand tomb for R. You are tired of writing about sex. I am tired of talking about gender. Our commingled theses tremble when we suggest corrective surgery. I am tired of talking about gender, especially in front of crowds. When we suggest corrective surgery, everyone gets upset. Especially in front of crowds where I know the people. Everyone gets upset and I have to deal with it later. Where I know the people, they know me almost like you know me, and I have to deal with it. Later I do, over dinner with you, where they know me almost like you know me. All evening I make you laugh the way I do, over dinner, with you, where I feel almost safe. I smile. All evening I make you laugh the way I did in the hospital. I say, I feel almost safe. I smile when you blush like I did in the hospital. 
I say teething at silicone teats when you blush like you're drinking. I have seen you teething at silicone teats too, or eyelids hanging like you're drinking. I have seen you avert your eyes, and gaze too, or eyelids hanging like you were about to fall asleep. Avert your eyes and gaze briefly upwards, quiet. You were about to fall asleep, and so I sent you home. I looked briefly upwards, quiet, but it would have been wrong, and so I sent you home. I look for a way to say this at dinner, but it would be wrong, so I say, rather than search for a way to say this at dinner, coffee, too busy, so I say. Rather than search, I will just imagine responding. Coffee, too busy? Fuck you very much. <laughs> I will just imagine responding, it slips out, I want to fuck you very much. <laughs> the restaurant is silent when it slips out. I want to take that back. <laughs> the restaurant is silent when you tell me not to take that back. I understand what you mean when you say you tell me not to. Our commingled theses tremble. I understand what you mean when you say you are tired of writing about sex.